Welcome to the Move Freely podcast, where you will learn skills that help you move freely in every aspect of your life. In studio today with me, I have Shannon Royden Turner. And Shannon is a coach to leaders of transformation. And what I can certainly say is that she is one of the most fascinating and knowledgeable people that I've met with. And in fact, I've started training and coaching under Shannon, which has been an enlightening experience. And keeping in line with the theme of picking up the pieces, I've asked Shannon to come in and share some information on how we can get back up after moments that seem so crippling. And before I actually introduce Shannon to all of you, something that I really loved that she said was that in order to achieve the kind of breakthrough results we need to get South Africa or yourself back on track and thriving, we need to build bold leadership. And in order to do that, we have to unlock the ultimate power of human potential, and that lies latent in most of us. So Shannon, welcome to the Move Freely podcast. Perhaps you can give us a little bit about you and what you actually focus on. What is your specialty? Thanks, Courtney. And yeah, lovely to, to be here and to be meeting um, a whole bunch of new people who will listen to this. Uh, so thank you very much. It's been a, a joy working with you so far, and I look forward to seeing where, where it takes us. Um, so yeah, I mean, my work is really uh, working with leadership, but it's a very broad conception of leadership, which is really ultimately that every single one of us are a leader of our own destiny. And the more that we can wake that up in as many people as possible, the, the, the quicker we can deal with the kind of turbulence that we face in the world today. So it's not about leaders only at the top of organizations. It's also about, you know, every single person living their life can actually wake up to living a really meaningful life um, by discovering their purpose. So it's broad sense of leadership. And it really looks at three different levels, which is if we're going to be able to transform the world to thrive in today's kind of crazy times that we're living in, we need to be able to work at the level of the person, at the level of organizations, and at the level of large kind of large scale systemic change. So how do we transform the, um, the economic system or how do we transform you know, cities? So we need to be able to work at all those three scales together. And I guess that's really what I've kind of specialized in through time. So it's this idea of leadership and transformation and in order to do that, we need to learn how to change our mindsets, because otherwise we just keep making the same decisions over and over again without understanding why we're we making decisions. And then the other part is really connecting to purpose. So our personal purpose, our purpose of our organizations, what, are, what is the purpose of an economy? What is the purpose of South Africa? You know, why does South Africa exist is a really interesting question, because from there we can then design systems that work. So I guess in a nutshell, that's kind of where I, um, where I play. <laughs> and from what I can see, you specialize in transformation out of sort of turbulent structures, turbulent times, turbulent moments. Can you give us a little bit more on that and why you've perhaps gone into that? So, yeah, it's been an interesting journey of my own just to kind of unpack that for myself as to how I've ended up doing, doing what I do. But I guess the biggest moment for me was um, when I was 10 years old and my dad was killed in a car accident. And um, my mom and I were left on the farm on our own. And we suddenly had to figure out what to do in this hugely turbulent time with massive uncertainty, we lost our leader, who was essentially my dad, who was responsible for the farm and for our you know, ability to feed ourselves. And so from that age, I was suddenly exposed to what happens when you lose leadership in a time that is crisis, confusing, 
lots of uncertainty and lots of unknowns. And in a sense, I kind of took that on with the whole complexity of the farm as this kind of large scale systemic challenge that, um, that I needed to figure out. And so that really awoke in me a deep quest to understand leadership, but also a deep quest of asking who am I and why am I and you know where did my dad go? What happens to you when you die? What does life mean? What does death mean? Where do we go when we die? What is heaven? What is hell? Are we good? Are we bad? And so really just a lifelong quest to, to kind of understand this thing called life. And so how do we flourish in turbulent times became this lifelong mission. And I just keep adding more and more and more pieces to ultimately understanding what is the power of human potential and how do we unleash that in people? Because I've come to realize that that is the foundation of being able to really transform any system is to focus on people. And it's the thing that we do least and it's the thing that we understand least. Humans are complicated beings though. <laughs> Until you understand the principles of human behavior, they're not actually, they're really simple. <laughs> we'll get there, we'll get there. Okay, and what I've realized having spent time with you and being coached by you and listening to what you've said is that there's always this strong follow through from what happened to us when, I was, when we were younger and the, the situations we were in, the interactions we had that shape how or what we pursue later on in life. And it almost seems like when we understand what we came from or what happened to us previously and how that shaped us going forward, there's this coming together in terms of clarity on purpose and being in the right place and being okay mm. with being in the right place, which mm. is incredible. You know, I did a, a micro expressions and body language training many years ago. And I remember them saying, your, your total emotional makeup is created up until the age of 12. And that for me blew my mind because I'd heard people say that and I was like, oh, that sounds great. But having gone through this process, which we'll talk about now and seeing how those interactions up until the age of 12 have really shaped and molded the life that I'm leading, and I think I'm very fortunate in knowing that I'm actually pursuing my purpose according to that, which I think some people are not always lucky enough to be on the right path. And we've probably all been in that. You hit a lot of negative walls or you, you just lack flow in your life. When things go wrong, you just, you're hacking basically. You know that you're not in flow. But when the, door, the right doors open at the right time, you start to feel like you're in flow and you're heading towards what you should be doing, what, you know, what your purpose is. Yeah. So, wow, well, yeah, so many, so many parts in there <laughs> to respond to. And I, and I think that that's been one of the greatest joys of the framework that I've been working with is the idea that the challenging parts that happen to us are the parts that wake us up. But our culture is the attachment to ease and to, you know, to the kind of easy life and the, the high life. And so we negate the, the down times, the challenges, the hard times that are actually the things that grow us, that are actually the things that wake us up to who we are. Our traumas, our challenges, these are the real juicy parts of our life. But we have a model in society now in psychology that what that has been about the victim and you know that that all these traumatic things happen to us and we live in this in this idea that we want to get rid of the challenge and only find the support we want the ease without the difficult we want you know we want this one side of world the happiness without the sadness and that just doesn't work the more we try and get rid of the one part the more it shows up because the truth is that there's always both sides and they're both participating in us becoming purposeful. And the more we're able to, and this is the part about picking up the pieces, right? 
the pieces are that in every challenge, there's a gem of growth, there's a gem of learning, there's some wisdom that is formed out of that. But unless we ask the questions that help us to figure out what those pieces are, that were the upside of the difficult times, the more we map that thing as just bad and don't want it to happen again and try and avoid that and just seek a life that is easy, supportive, and you know, don't want all the difficult parts. The truth is we need both because without the up, you don't, you know, without the down, you don't get an up. There is no such thing. Without sadness, there is no happiness because we have no, you know, we have nothing to balance it against. We wouldn't even understand that experience. So part of picking up the pieces is to say, how does this experience grow us? What was amazing about this experience, regardless of how difficult it is? And it's, it's not easy work to do because our mind wants us to believe that, you know, it's bad, something bad happened and, and that's that and we want to put it in a box and we don't want to look at it. But the more we're able to just say, well, what did we learn out of that? How do we want other things to be? How, you know, what were the gains that I got out of that? Because regardless of how difficult it is, there's always something that you learn or gain out of it. And that's real wisdom. And the more we can tap into that, the more we're able to stay balanced in turbulent times and remain purposeful. Yes. And the more we get clear on how every single piece, I mean, like a story that I just told about my dad, it's like going back and understanding, well, how did that serve? What did I get out of that? What was it about that experience that was meaningful to me? Why did I have to have that experience? Because... The truth is we're never not purposeful. This idea that we got to go out and find our purpose or there's some time when we're not being or that we inflow or we're not in flow. No, we always somehow having a piece of our purpose. But we think that when it's going easy, then we're in flow and we're purposeful and that the hard times are not. The truth is that it's the whole package because often... It's the challenging times that really wake us up. I mean, I've had so many conversations with people post lockdown who really had to question what is meaningful to them? How do they spend their time? What do they spend their money on? You know, what do they focus on? What is really meaningful to them? And how do they build a life around that? And that on its own is an amazing experience to come out of lockdown, you know, just yes. this kind of different idea. So, we always are purposeful and every single piece of our lives is giving us a piece that wakes us up to a new level of that purpose. But we have to learn to ask different sets of questions to really tap into that truth that exists because it's a different mindset to what we've been brought up with until now. And from there, you unlock human potential at a radical level. Okay, so the pieces have fallen People are groveling. They're on their hands and knees. They're looking for answers. They're looking for help. What is the advice that you can give them? So, I mean, the first, the first part of it is really to connect with your purpose. I mean, that is always the mechanism through which you can bring your life back into order. Because we, every single person has a purpose, a reason for being. And the more that we can connect back to that, the more we start to build our lives around that, the more we can unlock our own wealth, whatever wealth means to you. And I'm not just talking financially, but every person has wealth in what is important to them, what is meaningful to them, which is their purpose, the things that they really, really care about. So there is a set of questions that I work with. So there are two parts to it. It's, it's really looking at, you know, what does your life actually demonstrate? You know, what do you spend your money on? What do you spend your time on? Uh, what do you think about? What do you set goals towards that actually are materialized? What do you talk about in social circumstances? Because your life demonstrates what's important to you. You'll see like people will suddenly light up in a conversation when you start talking about a specific thing. That's because it's important to them, it's meaningful to them, and they will switch off when you're talking about something that's not relevant to them. 
So we constantly doing this, it's really about bringing a level of awareness to it. That's the key. And that's a simple set of questions that you can explore. And then the next part of it is to start to go through your life and look at how every piece of your life, the challenging times and the supportive times, how they have been contributing to you becoming that purposeful being. And actually, you're always on a quest for something. And so the last part of that is finding where you have taken on beliefs or assumptions about what we should do and how we ought to be in the world that stops you from really living into who you here to be. Because we get that from our family, we get that from you know our school, our university, our layers, the religions, all of these different places that tell us how we should be in the world can really stop us from actually living into who we really are here to be. So there's three kind of key parts to, to that work. And, and it's really, for me, it has been, you know, I'm in a deep quest over the last 15 years to really, you know, connect with that at a deeper and deeper level. And it just keeps going because you discover every time another level to it. And so it's just such an amazing journey to go on. And when you talk about your purpose, you know, everyone says, you know, I want to pursue my purpose or my passion. Just to confirm what you've said there, is that what you find to be meaningful in your life, what yeah. matters to you most. So it doesn't have to be, you know, saving, saving animals or saving children. It's what is most meaningful to you. So for some people, it might be a motherhood. For some people, it might be a beautiful garden. Other people, it might be something, you know, completely different, but it's what matters to them. And we shouldn't be comparing ourselves or using other people as a yardstick because what matters to them doesn't matter to us exactly and that's the challenge of so many human relationships that's why we struggle to relate to people because we want to impose what's important to me onto you rather than recognize that two people who each care about something unique right and have meaning in that but typically what happens is I want to come and impose what's important to me onto you and judge you for being good or bad relative to what I think is important. Yes. Uh, that's our source of judgment, right? Our source of judgment, bizarrely enough, is has its root in purpose because I think that what's important to me, everybody else must also think is important. And that it's just not the truth, right? Everybody is a unique individual who has an absolutely unique purpose. There are no two people who have the same purpose. It's like yeah. our, you know, the pattern of our retina, the fingerprints, it's absolutely unique. And the more that we can wake up to the curiosity of what is important to you and what is important to me and how does that work together, the less we can try and get other people to do what we think is important. Or it doesn't matter. People also have a thing like, oh, well, if it is a spiritual purpose, then that's important. But if your interest is to build wealth, then that's bad. Somebody's purpose has to be wealth building. Otherwise, we would, you know, financial wealth building. Otherwise, we would have no financial systems that underpin so much of what we can do in terms of a value exchange. So that people can go out and serve their purpose. So yes. we need those people as much as we need people who are on a quest to understand why do we exist and you know what is this universe made of as much as we need people who are educators. We need all the value systems, um, all the purposes that make up the whole. But so much of what we want to do is impose ours on somebody else. You know, there's something called cultural bias that I remember studying. And it's, we believe what is like our own culture is good and correct behavior. And what is unlike our own culture is bad behavior. And it's a surprising thing to see how many people or how we misperceive people's behavior and interactions with us because we're applying our own 
our own feelings on how they should be behaving towards us when in actual fact it's got nothing to do with you and i remember the book the four agree uh, the four agreements that said don't take things personally and i think this leads back to what you're saying it's not it's not your shit yeah exactly and i mean the the, the culture is a collective value system. So I also just want to be clear, when I speak about values, I'm not speaking about honesty, integrity, and, and those kind of social ideals that essentially make up like the perfect human. Because of course, every human is honest and dishonest, integral and disintegral. So when I speak about values, it's more the kind of underpinning of purpose, which is around, you know, different areas of life. So we have different people who care about you know, a financial or spiritual or um, physical or mental or family or social. We have all these different parts that make up our lives. And you have different people who have a, who, who different areas will be more or less important to them. And <clears throat> the same happens at different scales. It doesn't matter whether it's the person, a group of people, an organization, a country, they will have um, areas that are more or less important to them. And so culture is the kind of collective of, of that. And that's where so many of our breakdowns happen, right? Is that we say exactly your culture is wrong or mine because we look only through our own perspective rather than just being curious and go, wow, I wonder why that person has that lens or makes decisions in the way that they make because there's something magical when I can see me for who I am and see them for who they are, because from there we can start to make the two work together because that's far more powerful. Yes. Saying that the one is right and the one is wrong. What does strike me here is how transformational leaders could be if they understood all of this about the teams that they were working with, what makes them tick, why they are the way that they are there'd be such a beautiful understanding and cohesion between everyone because it wouldn't be this protective, you know, I need to protect myself and, and you're wrong or you're against me. It would be this complete peaceful understanding between people. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it'll have its moments that are not peaceful, of course. But, um, but, but the, the thing is about opening to a more curious than a protective space, you know, like curious about the other person rather than a need to prove that I am right or wrong. Because as soon as you realize that I'm right and wrong, depending on what you are judging me against. Yes. Both right and wrong, right? As is the other person, depending what lens you're looking at them through and what you're judging them through. So from a team perspective, it really opens up the ability to have more meaningful conversations. And the other part that's interesting from an even bigger team perspective is the idea of hidden agendas, right? So much of leading big systemic change gets stuck because people go, but what about all the hidden agendas? Well, what if we realize that hidden agendas are actually purpose? The reason that I'm sitting at the table is because I have an agenda. I have an agenda because I have a purpose. Right. But you're going to judge my agenda, right or wrong, depending on what you're trying to achieve, rather than recognizing me for somebody with an agenda because I'm purposeful. And how do we bring those two things together to make a bigger whole? You right. see this, you know, the environment versus economics or environment versus development. It's, it's always an either or rather than a both and. Right. This framework has the ability because, of course, there's an upside to economics and a downside to economics, as it currently is. There's an upside to environment and a downside to environment. And both of them have a purpose. Or you can bring them together and create something that integrates those two. Then you can actually make development happen. Right. Yes, yes. yes. And so I'm thinking from the perspective of someone who could be thinking, you know, I've lost everything, or I've lost a business, or I've lost a loved one, or I've lost the roof over my head. And there may be this feeling of hopelessness present within them. What 
advice or practical tools could you give to someone who's just feeling lethargic and you know that they've been knocked over by life and it's just really quite challenging to get up and test it and dust themselves off I mean, the first part of that is literally just a daily practice of looking for looking for the good. You know what I mean? It, it literally is because we tell ourselves a story, right? And what, the mind is an incredibly powerful mechanism for filtering information, right? Because if we were not able to filter information, it would, it would just be overload, complete overload. So we have a part of our brain that filters our reality and if i'm constantly telling my story, myself a story about how bad my situation is how difficult my situation is i'm only going to find evidence in the world that confirms that because this is the way the mind works reality has both sides right it has a good side and a bad side and if i want a story and a narrative that's just about the bad i will constantly find information that confirms that and i'll block out the whole other part of reality, which is the part that's, you know, the, the, the probably if you're going through a difficult time, the growth, the, uh, the people who are showing up and supporting you, the, all the good that is happening, because you can never have one without the other. But it's your mind that's going to block it out. So you have to start to ask the question. And if it's a really challenging time, start with just a daily practice of, what is supporting me? Where is my support today? You know, where is, um, who is showing up that's here to help me? Or what is supporting me in this time when I feel super challenged? Because you can never have a challenge without support showing up. But you're going to block that out if you're committed to believing that you're only in challenge. So if you just start a daily practice of looking for what the upside is, what are you learning out of the challenge? How is this helping you to actually direct your life in a way that is meaningful to you? And what is meaningful? You know, keep asking what is important? What is a priority in my life? And how is what's happening to me actually helping me to get onto my priority? What is meaningful to me? Those yes. are the two most powerful questions you can ask yourself. What is truly meaningful to me and how is what's happening helping me to get further on that track? So I have a, a, um, an example. I have an example of this from what I used in lockdown, which I think might give people something, a story to work and with. So of course, we all face challenges in lockdown. I train face-to-face -face trainings. All of a sudden, I don't have any of that business. So I sat down and I was obviously feeling deflated and overwhelmed. And that is not a normal state for me. So I sat down and I, I spent some time with myself and I decided I've got to change my mindset because without that, everything else falls to pieces. You are your frame of reference through which you see this, the world. If your frame is skew, your world is skew. So I sat down and I wrote down what are the challenges that I'm currently facing, listed those, and I said, why have those actually been benefits to me? Yeah. And that was the most incredible exercise. It was like a, a switch flicked in my mind straight after that. You know, the, the body-mind connection is incredibly powerful. Suddenly, I felt energized, reinvigorated, because I'd actually seen the benefit of it and how it was actually guiding me towards, you know, what I was pursuing later on in life. And that was an online learning business. So it had pushed me and given me the time to pursue that, which I otherwise would never have had time to do. Exactly. And it puts us into, I mean, a lot of people speak about this idea of gratitude. And we think that gratitude is about being grateful for the good times, right? I mean, it's easy to like that because we always have times in our life that feel like they're more in flow or that feel easier or that are abundant. And we kind of think it's easy to be grateful for those. The real task is to be grateful for the challenge. Yes. So the more that you can do that, you bring the mind back into calming it down because as soon as you go into fear and panic 
you've lost the game. And the only way to come back from fear and panic is to keep finding the other side of what's happening. So like for me in lockdown, thank goodness, I mean, I'd gone through three years before that of like hardcore, just or facing bankruptcy. So I've already faced three years before that what a lot of people are going through now. So I get it and it's terrifying. And I had to do all the deep work of how does going bankrupt serve me, you know, and it was one of the most profound experiences in, in my life, aside from anything really saving my marriage um, and, and just getting my marriage into, into another level. But um, the more we can practice gratitude for the challenges that we face, the more we're able to get a handle of life, the more that we're able to actually get through our potential. So like in lockdown for me, my challenge was not um, about my business because thankfully I got a, a big contract just before lockdown, but I had a hot, 15, 15 um, associates that I was coaching. And so I had to make sure that my mind was kept in balance because otherwise I couldn't serve. But obviously right. you've been bombarded by all of this fear and panic and all your friends and all the WhatsApp groups and all the stuff that's going on. And the only way that I could stay centered through that was to keep looking like every time I started panicking about the economy, it's like, okay, somewhere the economy is thriving. And I would just go onto the internet and find where is the economy thriving? What businesses are thriving? Just to keep my mind programmed to the absolute certainty that yes, there are businesses that are crashing and there are businesses that are thriving. Where do I want to play in that game? Where do I want to be? And just keep focusing on what am I here to do? I'm here to serve people. Okay. Keep my mind balanced, find both sides of what's going on so that I can stay present and actually serve the people that we're relying on me to, you know, to, to help them to, to deal with the turbulence. Yes. So it's just an incredibly powerful tool to, to basically keep your own mind centered so that you can remain on purpose. Right. And I love that you use the word programmed because actually a lot of us have to reprogram how we see things. Because as you said, once you fall into a fear state, you can't think, you can't innovate, you can't perform, everything falls to pieces. And I had an interesting conversation with someone the other day who's just launched a business. In fact, two different people. And they said, you know, if this business fails, I don't know what I'm going to do, or I don't think I can put more money into this business if it's going to fail, if it might fail. And I just thought, wow, that's a, that is the wrong mindset to go into opening a business with. Because if you go into the mindset, into the business with the mindset, I will do what needs to be done in order to make this work, if need be, if that's what it is then you're far more productive. You are constantly looking out for opportunities. You know, instead of looking for why this is not going to work, you're actually finding the opportunities which are abundant when you start to look. Mm. And, and, and of course, there's both parts to that, right? Because the, um, the, the fear is real and fear is an amazing feedback. Emotions are an amazing feedback loop because we try to suppress them or we try to hide them, but fear is an amazing thing. Like um, when fear does show up, it's there to tell you something, to look at it, right? It's there with a message. So, so often it'll, it'll be like, okay, like you really need to kick your thinking into another level here. Um, you know, find something that is, so, so, so an example actually was, um, um, how I, how I started talking with you about, about Huru Learn and, and developing this bold um, purpose is obviously I, I work on my own. And so it's always kind of contract to contract. And it's always this like when one contract finishes, the fear of what is the next one and learning to manage these kind of almost like feast and famine cycles that happen when, you, when you're a single entrepreneur, right? And I suddenly started having a whole lot of anxiety and I was like, okay, cool. What is this anxiety here to tell me about? And it was, you need to develop something that is more accessible to more people. And that's when bold purpose came into being was, you know, how can, how, how can I serve more people with what I have by developing a shorter, quicker course that more people can access? 
And so that fear helped to push all of this stuff that we started doing together. Right. And so it comes with the message when we're willing to hear the message, because often it is like, yeah, if you don't hear this message right now, your business is going to go into trouble again, you know? Yes. So hear it, get the message, and then do something about it, because it's, it's, it's also there to help you, you know, because it's, it's, it's both sides. We all have, so, so fear helps us to wake up when we, when we need to see something new. And we also have to stay present to opportunities because there's always opportunities. And the more that we are clear on what our purpose is, the more those opportunities just become more and more obvious. Because we're not, we're not distracted by things that are not meaningful to us. So that same mechanism that filters in our brain filters based on our purpose. It filters information based on what's meaningful. So you and I can have listen to a presentation by somebody and we will may as well be sitting in a different lecture because we will take out such a different story from that thing based on what's meaningful to each of us we'll extract different parts and have a whole different narrative about what that person was saying mm. and the same thing is happening with opportunities so our brain filters based on what's meaningful to us so the more we bring awareness to that the more we will filter out the opportunities that are really connected to our purpose and kind of help us to live a more meaningful life. Yes. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the term is called the reticular activation system. So our brains take in 400 billion bits of information per second. And according to what we have told our or programmed our brains to believe as important to us or our survival, it will filter out all the information that is not important and filter in everything that we've told it is important. So it goes from around 400 billion bits of information per second down to 2000 bits per second. So the rate at which we filter out information is huge. And that is why there's such a, a strong need for us to be clear on our purpose clear on what we're driving for because when we do that we're programming the brain to bring in that information to bring in those opportunities exactly and and the, and the more that I did this work what was really curious about getting clear on my purpose and building my my life to do only the things that are meaningful to me that was a commitment that I made discover my purpose and then fill my day with only the things that are most meaningful to me because that was the way that I knew that I could wake up my spirit wake up my aliveness and what was so curious is how spacious life suddenly became like I literally had so much time on my hand because all the busyness subsided like we have a belief in society that we need to be busy in order to be important and the more you actually connect with your purpose, the less that busyness, like busyness, and it's curious what we even call business is busyness, right? Yes. So it doesn't really matter whether, you know, what you're doing is moving you forward or is meaningful or fulfilling. As, as long as you're busy, then you must be important. Yes. But so little of it is really about does this fill you with life? Does this fill you up? You know, and so when you're trying to pick up the pieces, the main piece that you have to constantly be picking up is, is this meaningful to me? Is this valuable to me? Do I really care about this? Or is this something that someone else cares about that I think I should care about because they care about? And the more you do that, the more the busyness subsides and the more the opportunities kind of, it's not that they appear, but it's just you have more clarity so you can see them and you have more specifics. So the opportunities are no longer vague. It's, it's, and, and it just, it, it doesn't take the same amount of effort to make things happen. It's really curious. So what I'm interested, what I'm interested to hear how you would sort of place these is something that my father always said is, Courtney, character is doing things that you don't want to do. And what he was saying to me is sometimes you got to work bloody hard for something 
you know, you've got to work really hard for something that is not necessarily something you want to do, but something that's necessary to get to the outcome that you want. And how I interpreted that was as grit. So you said sometimes you just got to put your head down and you've got to work hard to get there. But now I sense that there's a difference between what you're saying and what I'm saying, but maybe you can clarify the difference for us. Yeah, that's cool. It's such an awesome thing because often we can think that if we're living a purposeful life, it's going to be easy. And it's not. <laughs> it's not that living a purposeful life becomes easy. It has all the same challenges. But the difference is, the key difference is, and you still have to work hard, like I still work hard, but it doesn't feel like work. Because I can be like, wow, I mean, I work get to the end of a day and there's nothing about that that felt like work. And I almost feel sometimes like, am I, am I cheat? It almost feels like a cheat, like I'm getting through the day cheating. And, and I'm so like, wow, that's so curious. It's just because that programming again has been, it has to be difficult in order for it to be or hard. Of course, when you are living more purposefully, it doesn't make the hard, the difficult, the gnarly parts go away. The difference is that you're willing to endure those because they have as much meaning. When we're in pursuit of the easy life, versus a purposeful life, we will try and have only the easy parts, the nice parts, the parts that feel good. And when it gets super challenging, we're likely to drop it because it's not meaningful enough to work through the difficult parts. So the difference between living a purposeful life is that you're gonna experience the pain and the pleasure, the support and the challenge, the difficult and the easy, but you're going to pursue through the difficult, the hard, the parts where you're feeling challenged because it has meaning in it. And all too easily we want to cop out. And that's the key to finding purpose and building a because business is difficult. Whatever you're doing is difficult. You know, being a human is difficult. <laughs> and totally acknowledging that and becoming present with that is part of the journey. And so the thing is, can we choose our challenges? And can we choose our challenges to be meaningful? Yes. So it appears that, you know, whether you are picking up the pieces or you're living a happy life, what's necessary is to get clear on your purpose. And you've spoken about your bold purpose and this is a program that you've created and I've actually done, I think, most of it. And it's been one of the most enlightening experiences of my life. And doing it has given me, first of all, it's been so interesting to understand me on a deeper level. And that's, you know, coming from the person that lives inside of me. I live with this person and I know them more. And the second thing is that you actually realize that where you are is right where you're supposed to be. But maybe for everyone else listening, you can share what this bold purpose is about. What do you do? What do people have to do? Cool. So, um, so it's basically a, a four-week program. So it's a deep dive into this eternal question of why do I exist? Um, and obviously the answer to why do I exist is purpose. It's the reason for your being. And that's the discovery that I just love taking people on because once they wake up to that, then the magic of creating becomes available to people. And so I guess my deepest love is to just wake people up to the fact that they are creative beings and that they have the ability and the capacity to create the lives that they want. And so bold purpose is really the first step in, in, in waking people up to that. And so the first, um, set of questions is really exploring your life, you know, a, a, a sort of a beginning intro to your life and your understanding already, because actually mostly when I ask people, what is your purpose, when they get to answer the question, they know, 
so when I ask most people uh, the question of, you know, what is your purpose? What are you here to do? And they, what they write down, they're quite surprised at what they write down because actually deep down, we all know this. And so it's really just a process of getting out some of the stuff that we already know in us, but we don't articulate it or we haven't written it down or we haven't said it to somebody and we haven't owned it. And then the next part of it is the questions around, you know, getting real on what your life demonstrates to be important to you. So what is valuable to you? Often we think that we should be, you know, like what you were saying, we should be saving the animals or we should be, and that would be purposeful. So the next part is really getting clear on what your life demonstrates to be important because you already have a decision-making matrix in your head. Like, do you ever wonder why you say yes to some things and no to other things? Or why you always have money for something? I always have money to do another personal development course, to expand my knowledge of the universe, to... But then I won't have money for a whole bunch of other things, which may be like going out for dinner or massive amounts of socializing. That's just not that important for me. So, so really becoming clear on what is the kind of what sits behind the decisions that you make, because that's a real insight into who you are. And you'll also start to find where you want to put things. Remember, like when we did it with you, and you wanted to, you change two things around because that's what you want versus what you really are. Yes, yeah, so and I changed, so I changed around. I'd ordered it, I think uh, community was first, then I put traveling and then I put financial abundance and then I changed that around and I put financial abundance second and travel third. When in actual fact, that's definitely not the case, but it's what I thought was right. Yes. And it's exactly that is helping you to see what is true for you, not what we think we ought to should have to do based on kind of more social norms of what we think. And then the next part is kind of starting to explore the idea that life's challenges are the source of our purpose and are waking us up to what we're here to do. And so that at a very beginning level starts to say, what are some of the things that have been challenging in your life? And can you look back if you were asked a different question to say, how did that serve you? How did that help you grow? You know, what was the upside to the really challenging thing that happened? And so just start to kind of explore the idea that maybe life, life's challenges are actually purposeful. They're not a mistake. They're not something to get rid of. They're a part of this thing called life. And then the last part is, is really looking at um, what is the bold outcome that you want of your life? So I mentioned earlier that one of my quests has been to wake people up to the reality that they are creative. And that means that you are participating in the creation of your own life. Life doesn't happen to you. You are intending through your decisions that you make, through your ideas, through your will, the life that you want. And one of, the, one of my students in the, in the associate group was like, wow, one of the biggest things that I take away from this is that I need to take responsibility for my life. And that's such a profound shift until we have that shift to take responsibility for our lives and everything that happens, we can't ever hope to create any change at any level, regardless of it's in my own life in an organization or large scale systemic change. We have to move from this place of wanting to blame to actually taking responsibility because as soon as we take responsibility, then we can actually start to direct our lives and to you know, participate in creating our own lives. And from there, we're much more empowered. Beautiful. What I can confirm is having done this course, it's definitely been one of the most light shedding moments and reassuring moments um, for why I'm here and why I'm doing and that what I'm doing right now is absolutely right. And the things that I feel like I can or I want to change it feels far more accessible to do that. So 
I mean, I feel like we could talk on and on forever about all of this. It's just absolutely fascinating. But I think we need to close off and perhaps have you on again for some more some more subjects because there's just we can dive into the the rabbit hole or go down the rabbit hole. So <laughs> what I would like to ask Shannon before we close off, is there any last bit of advice that you would like to share with people? You know, maybe about their purpose, maybe how to pick up the pieces. What's your last word to these people? I guess my last word is never stop believing that the impossible is possible. Beautiful. Beautiful. Shannon, thank you so much. I will be sharing all the hashtags and ways to contact Shannon below this video and below this podcast. So please get in contact with her. Thank you, Shannon.